Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for our numbers. I see that we have uh, our attendees starting to join us here. I hope you all enjoyed the panel and, uh, and we'll just wait another minute here um, for our breakout session to start. Great, it looks like our numbers are starting to, uh, to stabilize here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and good morning. Uh, my name is Tamara Gale and I'm a project manager with Petra LMI and I'll be your moderator for this breakout session with John Mora. If you'd like to ask a question, I'd please ask you to click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And we will get to questions in just a moment, but before we do, because the panel uh, session was a quick overview and we had several panelists uh, sharing their stories in that session. I'd like to ask John to share his uh, career transition journey in a little more detail. John, you have a unique and fascinating story. I'll ask you and Chewy to take it away. Thank you. Uh, I did start back in Brazil a long, long time ago. I think my first job was 94, just to give a hint on my age. And I started on TV. Then I decided to move to Calgary and took a job in oil and gas back in Brazil. Then I moved to Calgary, by the way, in 2008, just throughout the subprime crisis, but I felt it was a time of opportunity, not a time of crisis, because if you're at the bottom, you can only go up and I'd rather be there as we are going up. So that was kind of rational. Then I got into tech in Calgary found my way into oil and gas Calgary and then realized that that's not exactly what I wanted. And then went back to my roots, that's tech and IT. And this is where I am now. So I'm happy to take questions or I can hey. talk about anything else if you want. Well, let's, John, let's start with talking a little bit about uh, what you do now with Black Line Safety. Mm -hmm. So I manage the software group. So essentially we are a manufacturing Calgary. We produce some devices like this one that people use. So the reason we have the Zoom call is because someone is maintaining a cell tower or an internet uh, antenna somewhere for everyone or cable. And if they're working alone, they need to carry a device like this. So they have someone having their backs so what do we do is keeping people safe around there as they're working. So you can ask for help. There is a latch that you can ask for help. There is a different behavior if you press, if you pull. There are gas sensors, et cetera. Um, essentially, we build that product for the different industries and companies, including iron gas, but telecom utilities. And um, as part of my job, I interact with different people, different vendors. I have my team of 60 people spread across 11 countries, which I think one big value I brought to the table was my background because I understand different cultures, how to work in different time zones and how the, say the culture in Brazil, it's different than the culture in France and different than culture here and how you deal with different people. So that's one of the things I meant there, like, it's not your job that defines you, but the value you bring to the table. And there's always value that everyone brings. We just need to understand how to tap to that value. Well, thanks for uh, sharing a little more about that, John. I think that gives everyone an idea of, of uh, what you've been up to lately. <laughs> and uh, I have a couple of questions starting to come in. So um, let's start with Rizwan. Uh, Rizwan has multi, uh, has experience in drilling, engineering in several countries uh, and has been laid off in 2015. Uh, Rizwan has kept on pursuing oil and gas and was working with CNOC in 2019 and, uh, and another full-time job with SLB in early 2020, but then was laid off. So mm -hmm. Rizwan, you've moved, he's, Rizwan has moved to IT. What do you think about uh, the, 
what do you think about people evaluating where um, when they've been established in a role for so long, uh, what kind of inspiration they have to make a change to something else and how they might choose the next step? That's a hard one. So I need a second <laughs> to think, but I'd say you need to assess your skills. What Rizwan done, I think is very smart because every single company I know, they need IT. They may not be able to afford, they need IT. There is the downside as well that IT is seen as a cost center. You don't make money for the company. So you cost money, but it's essential. It's like accounting and HR. They can save you, reduce your costs, et cetera. And essentially you need like very few companies right now can survive without some sort of computers. There is always a dependence, even a website or social media presence. So IT is very broad in, in that sense. So I think that's very smart of him moving there. And the, the thing is, even if you are seen as a cost center and you go to another layoff because you work on retail or something, not necessarily oil and gas, it's much easier to find your next job as well because again, there is a immense pool of opportunities out there. Um, so I think you need to be looking at what's growing. Right now I can say tech is growing in Calgary, FinTech, uh, companies like Benefti, Shareworks, uh, Blackline itself, a new financial. You have a, at least a handful of startups that are now receiving millions of dollars and hiring dozens of people. And I know Neo, Benefti, Blackline, they're all hiring people by the dozen. So mm -hmm. we'll find a job there. Project management is another one. Like if you have that skills on herding cats and knowing how to plan a little bit ahead, that's the core of it. You need to refine your skills. A certification can help you a long way between you saying, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I managed my groceries budget too. I can manage your two, $3 million budget. You need some skills there. So, but that's something you, you can get on, on the side as well as you work through those things. Um, so I think that's it. Like look for the growing areas that align with your skills and see what you can bring there. In, this one was an example, like he knows how to deal with computer. I don't know exactly what he does on IT. He knows how to do some base programming or something. There is always someone in those skills. If you know some accounting and I see Edmundo, sorry if I don't pronounce your name right. Uh, he's talking about HR and moving to HR. Guess what those companies that are growing need? Mm -hmm. I'm, I have 10 open positions right now that I cannot find fast enough. And the agencies are tapping out as well. So. HR is booming, maybe not in oil and gas because they are laying off people, but there is some other section of the economy that's growing. That is that is great to hear, and I, and I do think you touched on then Windows question quite a bit in your answer there. So that was that was great to hear that you know tech is booming right now. It's a growing area, and something if we're looking for career transitions might be a great area to consider and explore a little further. Yep. Um, you also touched on project management. Can we talk a little bit about? I know uh, you you work with a particular method, the agile method in project management, and you touched on people maybe upskilling a little bit and, and learning a little bit more about project management. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit and your approach and uh, what you suggest there. Yep. Um, so I, I did choose to become a project manager as I moved to Canada because I felt there was going to open more doors to me. Uh, it's more portable between industries. Um, I did volunteer with PMI there, got my PMP back in 2006 as part of my move into Canada in 2008. I got here back then I was doing waterfall, but then I fell in love with Agile and, and that. So one side of it is I just see myself as an Agile because I think that fits well with the cloud type of development. I'm, I'm doing right now and that's what I wanted to do. That was one of the things on my checklist, like I'm looking for a company to get out of oil and gas. What I want to do, I want to be in a startup environment, I want to be in tech, I want to be in a growing company and I want to be doing cloud development. So I had a list, that's not the entire list, but I did write down those things. And I 
for four years, I was in the board of directors of PMI as well, helping people around. So I, I valued certification a lot. Like for example, getting certification, that means if I'm interviewing you, I'm not going to ask if you know how to do a schedule or how you build a schedule. All those basic questions are out of the way. I'm going to refine the questions now. And uh, I believe those skills are very portable because when I'm looking for a manager, I'm kind of asking the same questions like, how are you going to put together your budget? How are you going to manage people? How are you going to mitigate risks on the things you do? So those fundamental skills are the same. And if I'm looking for a developer that has a PMP certification, I know that person has potential to be a manager, for example. I know they need to be communicating, otherwise they're not successful mm -hmm. project managers. So I, I look into uh, how can I leverage that person and what that person is bringing as the core value they may have, making assumptions based on the certifications they may have. And I, I see a solutions arc that certificate comment there as well. But the certification just gets you through the door. That just makes sure I look in your resume. I'm not going to hire you because I have a certification. I can tell you that. And that's like 95% of the people up there. I'm going to hire you because you convinced me in an interview that you can do the job and bring the value. So the certification just gets your name out of the door. And maybe if I'm posting for a PM or a solutions architect that I have that certification myself, um, maybe if I have a hundred of those resumes, I'll shortlist my top to any by saying, hey, I'll drop everyone that doesn't have the certification, that someone that's not doing that job for 10 years. At least you're shortlisted. That's as far as your certification are going to get. Of course, with the exception if you're discussing a PH or some professional certification, like if you're a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, those are uh, regulations. It's not just like the PM or EDABA certification. So those you must have to be able to do your job, which is different. If I'm hiring you as an engineer, you must have the PH. If you don't have, it's kind of the same thing. Like I'm not even looking at your resume. The, the triage system is dropping your name because I'm going to put it on Indeed. You need to have a PH, you need to have a PM and Indeed is not even forwarding your name to me. So you, you're essentially invisible if you don't have those. Um, did I answer everything in your question, Tamara? I just thought maybe we'd expand a little bit on, you were talking about, you know, it's great to get the certifications. Uh, what happens if you have done that as a first step and maybe you don't have a lot of experience yet to sort of stand behind you and say, oh, I've done this before. Uh, what, what would you recommend to people who are just sort of, they, they're starting to learn about a, um, a, like project so management or some other kind of um, role uh, and the certification that applies to it. How else can they help themselves stand out in the job market and have someone take a look and take a chance on them? Okay, uh, I can talk about some of those. And I think my main suggestion is get a side hustle. As a PM, it's a little bit harder because usually PMs are tied to uh, bigger companies traditionally mm -hmm. because smaller companies cannot afford a PM, but even there, there is an opportunity. You can help, uh, for example, a few years ago, I helped three guys that were having their startup and they were very focused on the commercial side and on the tech side. And they just said like, I don't know how to put a proposal together. I don't know how to put a, a, a plan together. And if I go to an investor, that's the first thing they ask, what's your burn rate? How, how much money you plan to make? And, and I know you know, they, they're talking to me. I know you know how to put a budget and a schedule together. Can you help us out? And I said, sure, I like you guys. I do that for free, like just pay me lunch or something. Uh, I work with them on a Saturday and I put something together. So imagine that I want to hone my skills. I'm doing this with someone that's going to say, hey, John, this is not what I wanted. And they're going to give me feedback and I may need to invest more than eight hours to, to create that for a company. I was a senior PM back then. Um, just switching gears a little bit. I saw some questions on Python and AWS tools as well. Uh, again, get a side hustle. Do something, you don't need to make money. You, you don't need to make a lot of money, but find an opportunity, get something on Python and put on a app store, uh, put on Google, 
give to your friends to play. When I was learning to Java, for example, someone told me I was a PHP developer and someone told me like, PHP has no future, John, you should learn Java. And this was before I became a PM in 2006. So it was 2000 something, 20 years ago, let's say 2001, just to use round numbers. Uh, and I was like, how am I going to learn Java? I can do a blockbuster management thing and no one is going to use that. Or I can do a game, like I like games, I'll create a game that I want to play. And I start creating that game. Guess what? That game went live in 2004. I still play that game. I have a few hundred people that play that game. I ask for a donation. I don't charge for the game. It is the game I wanted to play. It's not a massive, it's not a Fortnite. But every year I get about $5,000 on donations. Oh, wow. Can I quit my job on that? No. <laughs> but uh, things I do with my game, $5,000 can pay for my vacation trip in a cabin in BC every year. It pays for my computer every year, right? So $5,000 pay for those two things. I don't need a new computer every year. So it pays for a week in a cabin in BC and a computer every two, three years. Um, and guess what? When I wanted to know more about machine learning and AI, guess where I went to do those things? I said, okay, my game, I have player versus player. Wouldn't it be cool that every time a player drops an AI takes over? And I went to learn those tools and apply to my game. Again, the goal was not to get a job, was not to get those things. But because I had that experience, just tying that back to Edmundo, uh, I was actually selected by a couple of companies in Calgary to be the technical interviewer for those. So they would have someone, they would have a short list, they would say, John, before we present this candidate to the company, do you mind interviewing those? And I like you because you can interview a developer, you can interview a data science, you can interview a BA, you can interview a PM. And I was like, sure, how much you pay? Oh, we can pay this much. And how many hours you need? Uh, this much. And can I build my own schedule? Yeah. So that was my side hustle for a while. I was interviewing for people and I actually stopped doing that when I got this job. Want to avoid some conflict because now I'm in a hiring position. They get weird if I know what the competitors are doing as well and some of those things. But also because I have no more time for my side hustle. Even my game, I was telling my wife, this Saturday was the first time in a year and a half that I could spend like eight hours in my game. I was, I had no idea I was missing that as a hobby. Right. Uh, so if you build those side hustles and could be something like my wife is doing, she wrote a book and she was all happy That's because awesome. she got a 500 check from Amazon because a book she wrote five years ago. Yeah. So again, it's not about the money, but you're seeing that growing and she's honing her skill. She's improving her English, I'm doing my things. And guess what? That side hustle that someone was paying me for to do one or two interviews a week got me this job because guess what they ask when you are taking over a team of 14 people and you have a plan to get to 100? Can you hire people fast enough? And I said, I can. Tell me why. Because I'm doing this, 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 and this. And they go, okay, yeah, you can. Let's move on, next yeah. topic. Can you put a schedule and a budget and define how you're growing your team as they were a company? I can. Why? Because I had my company. I, I managed $23 million budgets for others. And I done this and I done that. Okay, you can. So the same way the company is checking, putting marks on, on everything they're looking for. And, and the beauty of those side hustles is if you're doing that right, and if you get that wrong, or if you're doing the side hustle right, and that fails, you just invested our time. And guess what? By the time you invested, you should get a proportional amount of learning. And that learning sticks with you forever. It's true. That's and a good tip. There is no risk that you can do with very little money, like me interviewing for people or me trying to do something for my game. I just had to make sure I had a computer and some Sunday mornings free until I start having kids and etc. If I want to interview for someone and hone my skills there, uh, I'll take a $20 pay. 
I don't ask for a hundred, two hundred dollars. I take a twenty dollar pay because I want to hone my skills and I'm going to make some mistakes. So I share that risk with you, company. But I can do those eight a.m. and five p.m. meetings because guess what? That's the time people prefer to be interviewing if they have a job. Mm -hmm. So that's a easy win-win, and it's not about money because even if I make a hundred dollars an hour, or twenty dollars an hour, two interviews a week, it's not going to change your life. So it's about the growth. That's how you should see those side hustles, and some. You may collect some benefits like my game of my wife books years from now. And that's kind of what I said, like build those engines that are going to make money for you if you're not paying attention to. I still have yes. donations flocking into my game. If I'm doing something or not, it's all running on the cloud. I get the cloud learnings from there as well. So all those things. It sounds like you've taken inspiration for those who are maybe looking to sort of augment their experience and and like you say they need to maybe get uh, something on the side um, to build up their experience. You mentioned hobbies as being one area that they could look to. You also mentioned going to your network and looking for suggestions, having people say to you, you know, I think this skill is in demand. Why don't you try learning that? And you mentioned learning uh, programming, Java programming in particular. What are some other areas that you think uh, people who are looking to transition could start looking for opportunities to create that those opportunities for experience, to gain experience and, and uh, help them build, sort of beef up their resume a little bit? Really, the sky is the limit. Um, for example, my time volunteering with PMI, we deliver professional level conferences and I was just involved there. And I know how that works inside and out now because I was there for four years. So I run four of those big conferences and monthly workshops and webinars. Um, I have a friend that he just joined a startup, not just like he joined a startup a few years ago, but what he wanted is I'm a duck. Like everyone wants to be an eagle and fly high and be the one flying the highest. But I'm a duck, I have no aspirations to be an eagle. And the duck thing is, I know how to swim, I'm not the best swimmer. I know how to fly, I'm not the best flyer. I know how to walk, so that's the duck thing. I can quack, but I'm not the best singer. There's always a better bird in any of those. The kingfisher or, or the eagle flying, a canary singing, but how I use my skills and he joined a company that needs organization and needs someone to put together those events and to figure out how you get this manufacturing and this supply chain without being an expert. Because if you're in a small company in a company of two to 20 people, your job is doing everything that has to be done. And one day he's interviewing, the other day he's trying to find an accountant and discuss why you're paying that much taxes. So you're doing a little bit of everything. So. Um, it's all about identifying those opportunities and matching those to your strengths. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to put the effort in and create those. Like if I'm a volunteer at PMI, I don't get to sit on the board if I just want to give them one hour a day or one hour a month. Uh, there are times I was doing 46 hours a week and there were times mm -hmm. I took vacation to be able to help them to put the conference through and I was never, I was not even the chair of the conference, for example. I know the chair of the conference usually takes one, two weeks vacation on that days leading to the conference so you can deliver a real world-class level conference. Uh, but now that I've done that a few times, I don't even think like I, I was discussing, I need to put a workshop to triage 33 interns on my company. I'm doing that with less than half of my brain discussing with a junior developer coaching the general developer, how he's going to organize all that and how we're going to select three interns there. Because I got that experience on helping other people putting together those events and organizing those things. So each one of those added things to my toolkit that I can use those now. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like volunteering has been a great way, you know, looking for those opportunities could be with professional associations could be with uh, organizations within yeah. within your your community that are um, that are looking for volunteers and need support. So any of those avenues could be an opportunity at that point. Would you agree with that? Uh, totally. I did volunteer within from the code, for example, 
and I was helping them with maintenance. I painted walls, I fixed the leaky faucet, like basic stuff that they would save money on. And guess what? I save money on those same things in my house right now. I did paint. Oh, you cannot see the room. I am, <laughs> but I did paint most of the things in my home. Uh, if I'm out of luck, I may find a maintenance job somewhere. I did volunteer with mustard seed. I see how the supply distribution goes on the serving food. And I always interested on those things and asking those things. Uh, I didn't volunteer fully there, I was just serving, but I asked people around and I get to understand how the business operate and how they help people. So all those things I'm learning, I'm getting better professionally because of those curiosities you exposed to and you show that curiosity. And guess what? You never know who you're asking that question. That question you're asking that person for and showing interest and, and indirectly showcasing yourself, that person often is a VP of something at a big company and they may put a good word for you. Uh, and that not should be your angle. You should not be volunteering to get that connection. Right. But guess who has time to volunteer? A lot of decision makers. Mm -hmm. So you're going to stumble on those people. And even if you don't ask them for a job, which you shouldn't, just listen to what they have to share with you as yeah. well. On top of the uh, benefits you get from volunteering, I volunteer to give back my time because I needed that on sometimes. Uh, so I do from a very selfish personal reason, but there's that benefit as well that you're building your network. It, you, you may by luck, find something mm -hmm. uh, that leverages your career. And sometimes it's just a conversation. Like I, I'm right now looking for a team lead for my API team. I'm forming a new team and I need a team lead. Maybe a volunteer and asking someone, hey, do you know someone? And they may say, yeah, I have a friend. Or they may say, yeah, me. So they did not ask me, but guess what's going to happen? What's the next thing that comes from my mouth? Tell me more about you. Or tell me more about your friend there. And that's what networking is all about, right? And yeah. the opportunity is there. You're just ready to take an opportunity when they present themselves. Yeah, it sounds like it's taking advantage of almost a combination of those opportunities, networking, finding different places to get your experience. Um, and having and then, more skills to be ready when they present themselves. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great advice. Uh, we have a question from Maurizio, and we, we might we might need to talk about it a little bit. He he's saying he wants to, he has experience um, in uh, in industry and wants to aim to help Canadian companies expand into markets overseas. I'm not exactly sure, Maurizio, what you mean by that, but uh, but. Uh, John, you've come from a place where you have worked in uh, different countries and have sort of breached some of that international, <laughs> uh, that international arena. arena. Um, how might someone go about, you know, uh, you did a lot of research before you came over here to, um, to figure out what uh, might be your target industry or what, what skills were in demand over here. What would you suggest for someone who's looking to sort of start something in another country? Um, I'll answer this question with the things I've done. For example, when I was in Brazil and decided to come to Canada, and then I decided I want to go as a PM, so it's more portable, even knowing that the language would be a uh, hindrance for me. I still have a thick accent, I acknowledge, but at least I know now I can communicate. I could barely communicate. My English was not great back then. I thought it was good. I was wrong when I found my first job and had my first question. I had to sell an idea. That's when you really mm. know your language skills. And I was <laughs> struggling. But then you apply the effort there. But for example, once I decide to be a PM, I look at all the companies that are sponsoring PM organizations in Calgary. And then I get to know back then companies like Pricon and various still from Brazil. And once I get my visa and I had a time that I would be landing, I start sending emails. Hey, I'm going to Canada. This is my resume. I have my plane ticket. I'll be in Calgary on this day, 30 days from now. I would love to get to know what your company do and understand what you guys are doing and how you're helping. So 
this is how I got the hold on the companies and start looking for the companies that are there. And I was looking for an IT PM, a software development PM, things around those areas because I was trying to match my skills and Calgary was always strong on that side as well. It's not the strongest oil gas and everything else, but Calgary always had a tech presence to the history I know of Calgary, of course. Um, but then on my first job at Smart, for example, Smart was an international company. They had manufacturing plants. They were planning to expand. The manufacturing plant was in Canada. They were struggling trying to figure out offshoring work to India and a few of those things. Um, so for them was attractive. There was the immigrant and was adding diversity to them, not on the sense of just meeting a government checkbox on diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that was that big, but on John understands that someone in India is going to agree with everything the boss says. And when the boss says, can you do A? They're going to say yes. Can you do B? They're going to say yes. Can you do C? They're going to say yes. If we're asking a Canadian, they would be challenging me on the A because they know A, B, and C is too much. But in India, it's not the culture. If the boss is asking, can you do this? They're going to say yes. But guess what? They're not going to deliver those because as everyone else, when they bite more than they can chew. And when someone in Japan is agreeing with you, doesn't mean they're agreeing with your thought. They're agreeing, I understand what you're saying. And then you go into a meeting after checking with them. And you say, and I think we should be doing this. And so-and-so agrees with me. No, I disagree. I think we should have another path. But you're agreeing with me before the meeting, personal experience. No, I was agreeing that I understand what you say. I was saying, yes, I understand what you're saying. I never said I agree with the path we should take. So that international experience, some people may not even understand if they live the entire life just in Calgary, in that uh, bubble that some people may leave, no judgment at all, but some people don't have the opportunity, some people don't have the interest. But we immigrants coming from other countries, we bring those things. For example, in my current company, we're struggling with companies in India. And I said, why are we dealing with India and dealing with time zone and that much different culture when we could be doing in Latin America? And I wish I could share my screen, not sure if I can. I can show you a map. Can I share my screen? Oh. Yeah, you, you should be able to, yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. So I just want to share this map. I'll let you know when we, when we can real see quick. it. I hope you can see a map. Yes. This is the map where I have people working for me right now. And probably you see a pattern there. I stop at all my contracts in India without breaking the bank. We pay a little bit more but I have no time zone difference anymore and I'm leveraging my Latin America connection and understanding of the Latin America market. And I think that was Mauricio's uh, question there, how he can leverage. This is how I leverage yes. mine. I know how to manage developers in Brazil. I know those connections. I knew who to find to set up shops there, to support my people there. Um, and guess what? They are now in the same time zone. We get rid of the communication problems. Uh, there is a bar we set that they need to be able to communicate in English well. They need to be working Calgary hours. I don't care where they are. And I do have some people in Armenia and Egypt as well. And we still have challenges there, but those people, they've been working with us for years and I don't want to touch them because they have a lot of knowledge as well that offsets the, um, the time zone challenges. But mm -hmm. guess what movies they watch in Brazil? North American movies. They understand nine to five and boss and hours and the North American culture much better. So it's a smaller gap than trying to find someone across the world in a completely different culture. So this is how I leverage this and bringing that benefit to the company and everyone is happy with those top performers we have now because people in, in this area, they have, this is from a different presentation, I even had to deal with a war. If you don't know, Armenia was invaded by Kazakhstan a few weeks ago, so I will talk about risk management. Um, but I'm just showing this slide to show that I brought that to the table. They were trying to outsource to India because that's what everyone does, right? That's the mm -hmm. internet joke, outsource IT to India. 
because they are cheap. But then you are sourcing to India at $27 an hour. I cannot source to uh, Brazil and Venezuela. I think someone said that's from Venezuela. Hi. And they may be happy with $35 an hour. For the companies, it's what? 20% increase, not even. But the leap on communication and what you save on onboarding is massive for the company. Those uh, six, seven dollars pays for this by far. Um, this is what someone can bring to the table, someone like Mauricio. Uh, I think you're talking about equipment for gas compression and fabrication. You know, all those vendors, you, you know who can do the integration, you can have the pieces, how you ensure those, how corruption works on those countries. Because let's be real, I mm -hmm. understand corruption a lot. That's one of the reasons I left Brazil, because I don't want those. Yeah. But if you want to operate in some of those countries, you don't need to be corrupt. You don't need to participate on, but you better understand what you're signing up for. If you want to operate in places like Brazil and Russia, uh, you need to understand corruption. Yeah. And I made sure that every single company I worked for or with in Canada, I always ask for the, what's your position on corruption and those things because they, for me to work with them, they have to be zero corruption. We never pay bribes. We, we never facilitate those things because that's what I wanted. That forced me to leave my home country because I was in shock with those values. And that's what I look for in those companies here. So uh, circling back, I look at for the companies that were growing in industries that were growing, but I think I can add my value too. I look for companies that are like in the 50 to 200 people range because I like the companies that grow fast and you don't grow fast a company that has 20,000 people. No. <laughs> uh, so I look what's important to me and guess what? Even with those high requirements, I think I shortlisted to a hundred companies that me non-professionally could list yeah. in Calgary. Let's recap a little bit since we're sort of back on on tech here and and the you know I know we touched on it a little bit earlier in this conversation but the outlook for tech um, as you're saying and and startup companies if someone's starting to look at entering the tech world where uh, where might they find those opportunities what is there a good way to um, to figure out what companies are out there what companies are starting up. Uh, how might someone sort of break into that sphere and, and start to do some research about where they might find their opportunity? There are. Um, there are a few different avenues that come to mind, and I, I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list. One, depending if you can, there are boot camps. There are uh, Edge Up, uh, Lighthouse. I don't remember the other names, but I Robo know- Garden, I'm... perhaps? Being exactly. Robo Garden is one, yeah. State has a program, uh, UFC has a program on those. I'm sure Montreal has something as well. I'm not familiar with that one. But I know I have personal connections or professional connections with five of those in Calgary right now. Either consulting or trying to hire from them or sponsoring capstone projects or something. So if you do have the time and some are government sponsored, so you need to drop your job so you don't have the income Okay. but the government pays for the classes yeah uh some you need to pay yourself i like those a little better as an employer because i know like you really pay attention to that i believe if i need to pay for my kids education they are not paying attention to the, what the teacher is saying right. but if they need to pay from their pocket so it's more in that sense not that one is better than the other it's a principal thing and that's very particular to me so i believe if you're paying for your education you're placing a bet on yourself, so I can bet on you as well. And if you're paying, you're placing a better bet than if the government is paying for you. Uh, no demerit to either though. Again, personal thing. But you have all those. Some are night courses, some require full day dedication because they want to condense. So that's one. And guess what? If you got into those jobs, all the startups look into those as well because if they need to hire someone, I'm getting a senior professional 
that's a junior programmer. So I get a senior professor, professional at a junior rate. I just hired one, we sponsored the Capstone project for one of those programs at SAIT, and we hired one of those to us. I didn't have to teach, he was a PM geologist, like bad programmer. He, he went to the exam, but guess what? Great need, knows how to organize things, knows how to communicate, great professional. So if you think the professional is a bigger spectrum and everyone, everything a professional brings to the table, I got a deal, that's a bargain. Because two, three years from now, that person is going to be going toe to toe with a senior programmer I have, plus everything else that he brought to the table on day one. So that's one. Look into those programs. Uh, I'm sure you can find a lot of those and uh, even Pratal and I probably can have some of those in a conference like this. Uh, someone is talking about this, I, I'm positive. So there are some assets, assets right there. The other one is meetups, getting to meetups. Calgary was very vibrant. Uh, COVID right now makes everything harder, but they're still going. I know meetups for startups. I know meetups where okay. if you have a startup, you go for and meet with other startup fellows. And you may realize I'm trying to get this off the ground. You're trying to get this off the ground. Probably are better working together permanently or for a while, just figuring out our trading cards, like how you do your marketing, how you do your social media, um, which is my next topic, social media, by the way. But Investing meetups, you have meetups on Agile, you have meetups on AWS, you have meetups for recruiters, you have meetups for recruiters for startups. My wife was attending some of those. Like you probably have a meetup for anything. And if you want, just create a meetup for yourself as well and get mind like it fellows and go around those. And those meetups could be in a study group to, for you to get something, a meetup to get that game of yours going where you're honing your skills or discussing a topic on data or quality or whatever you have. I put money on the table. There is a meetup there. Hindered by COVID if you're thinking Calgary. But now let's flip the coin. Everyone is going virtual, including meetups. So attend one in Vancouver, one in Huston, one in Toronto. Doesn't really matter. COVID is your friend that way. The <laughs> lockdowns is your friend. Just get into those and trade ideas and see that you never know the next opportunity is going to be. And you could be helping them remotely as well. So that's another one. And the obvious one is social media. Um, sorry, before I get into that one, some uh, organizations like Calgary Economic Development, uh, Calgary, not Calgary, I think it's Tech Western Collective, I can remember the names as well, but some of those, they are always discussing how we're going to help the startups, how we're going to help the companies, how we're going to help the tech industry. And they have all those directories as well. They can point you, give you a list of hundreds of startups segmented by industry, by healthcare, um, like Curve Dental or Calgary Scientific or financial like Catapult or Neo Financial or something safety like Black Line, they have all those as well. So the government is also a source of those and those are, I believe, non for profit funded by government. So look for those, that space, you have a lot of assets there as well, you're going to find. And then finally, social media. If you look in Facebook, if you look in LinkedIn, if you look in uh, the main platforms, Twitter, I'm not a Twitter guy, I don't get how Twitter works, it's not for me. Or if you're even younger, Snapchat and those, then I don't even know how those <laughs> work. Sorry, I'm old. But leverage those, find people, ask friends, put in your network. Hey, if I want to find a startup that does this or a startup that needs a technical writer, that's a question someone else posed. Right. Uh, who you know, and that person may not even be in the startup, but they may say a friend of a friend knows this or, Listening to the radio and they were talking about this chocolate person doing something. Uh, you have all those things there. Uh, and those are all easy, low barrier assets for you to start tapping from. Those are some really great tips. So I hope everyone has been taking notes <laughs> on that, John, for sure. 
so I I wonder if we can get maybe a little bit a little bit personal perhaps and talk about a technology that either you have been involved with or maybe something that someone has done that you admire. Um, what what technology has excited you in, in recent times? Uh, more recently, I'm into AI and machine learning, mostly because if you look at top minds, like if you ask Bill Gates and someone asked, someone asked Bill Gates, what's the top five professions of the future? Machine learning and AI is always one of those. And that's, I believe, is the next generation uh, better and better, better. So I've been looking at that and Black Line is investing a lot in that as well. So it's professionally and personally very attractive. Uh, cloud development is a second one that I've been going on for over a decade now. So AWS, you can literally get together whatever someone else done in a day. I can say, I can get a contact tracing solution for the government just building on top of AWS in a day. My intern can. With image recognition saying that three people were less than six feet apart without wearing masks for five minutes. And there is a good chance that with another week, we can even pinpoint who those three people are just from the image. If that's your idea, you can cobble those things together. And maybe that's where we're going to a meetup, someone that has the tech side and have the opportunity idea side and you work together. Um, so getting to know more about cloud development, that's how you scale, how, that's how you do things for millions of people. Uh, my game was not designed to serve millions of people. That's why I have 700 people playing. And sometimes I get in problems because it's too many people playing at the same time. <laughs> um, so AWS is one. If we're discussing programming languages, for example, Python and Java are the two I would go for, for server side things. Each one has their strength, but Angular or React on the front end. If you do want to do some cool, like the what you see when you're using Netflix, that's React, that's Angular. That's okay. a combination of both. That's what I think Netflix is to me the best site. That's the one that inspires me because it's easy to use. My five-year-old can use Netflix without me ever teaching her <laughs> anything on the TV, on the computer, everywhere. Uh, they cannot figure out how to use Amazon Prime, for example, <laughs> or even Disney Plus. They struggle a little bit, but better. Okay. So those are the technologies I would suggest people investing on, on tech. And there's a lot you can do. You can come up with some machine models, machine learning models, like I said, just doing free courses on Google and AWS. Free courses. They teach you everything that oh. university is teaching you as well for free. And they have things on marketing as well and even other resources like search engine optimization and other stuff. They're giving gold away for free. Because yeah. they increase usage. The more people know, the more people use. It's true. Yeah. Uh, let's touch on um, another personal question. Have you read a good book lately? Something that might be helpful to career transitioners? I have but the books I read the most are fantasy books. So not really into those. Sometimes <laughs> I get a management nugget or something. Mm -hmm. That's a great approach to a problem. Um, but that got me helping some friends that now ask me to read their books as they are trying to get into that. So I, I think in a way I'm a book reviewer and I make my critique to them and they take that with a, so professionally, maybe that's my retirement plan. I'll read books as a profession. But if you want to get into tech, I like the Phoenix project. That's one. Uh, the Phoenix project is a management book applied to tech on how you have the different personas and the different types and how you deal with those and how you manage those and what each one is bringing to the table so you know how to get the value off, what personas to get rid of. That's a nice one. Uh, I'm looking around for sheet. Um, one that 
not recently, but got me into this is the Lean Startup. And I like the agile planning from Mike Kahn. Uh, those are the ones that when I needed to understand agile and how that works and how I respond to people saying agile has no planning and I know that's not true, but I don't know how to explain why that's not true. I went to that agile planning from Mike, Mike Kahn book and there was a great book that explained me not just the why's but the how's and they're both equally important. And the Lean Startup to get the mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset that I use for everything I do. Uh, I was discussing yesterday in a team meeting and they were saying, we need to understand our goal for six months and what's a quick action thing that we need to discuss and like what we need to do next. And I was asking, what's our uh, February 21st milestone? And they come back with, we need to think the six months go, and then from there we backtrack everything and what we need to be doing next and et cetera. So it was a longer conversation, this is the short and I was like, what is the value of doing that if we know what is the next step and we know what is the highest value thing we should be doing right now? What do you think is going to change on the next steps? And we know the next steps is going to bring us beyond the March, uh, February 21st milestone. And no one could answer me that note. And where that thought came from was the lean startup. Like you should know as an entrepreneur what's the most valuable thing you should be doing right now. And that's how you prioritize your backlogs, your projects, your resources. And if you have resources, that's why you should be applying those. Otherwise you slow down to the death by a thousand cuts and you don't get anything right. So you need to be laser focused when you have a heavy resource constraint at the sacrifice sacrifice of everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you read a book like, when I read the book like Lean Startup, that's when that got to me like, why I keep multitasking? Everyone says multitasking is awesome. But by reading that book and another book that I don't remember on theory of constraints and some of those, I educate myself like, now when I need to do things right, I get one thing. I literally close the Slack, Outlook, everything I just get Word. If I need to write a job post that I'm struggling with, I open Word and that's the only thing I have in front of me. Mm -hmm. And then I get that thing done really well. If I want some C minus level, I do three, four things at a time, but I know how to jump between those. I, I like to think I know how to jump between those things. If I'm preparing a presentation for the board, guess what? I'm doing four things at a time or I just have one thing in front of me. And usually I block my day not to have meetings, distractions, so I can dedicate 100%, right? That's yeah. when you excel at something. You give all your attention to that one thing. So those books helped me in that. Well, thanks, John. That's a great, those are some uh, interesting reads for sure. So hopefully, Hopefully our participants today have gotten some ideas and, and uh, if we could have just one parting thought because we're close to the end of our time today, uh, what would be one thing you suggest that everyone uh, participating in this conference um, takes away and, and does, you know, what's one thing they can do towards a career transition? Uh, it's more than one thing, but I, I'll give one thing as a sequence of steps. Um, you need to be able to deliver your value. So maybe that's the one thing, but to be able to deliver your value, you need to, going backwards, to hone your skill and to highlight that value. So that's the learning part, having the side hustle, uh, trying those, volunteering, whatever you do to exercise that because only practice is going to make you better. Um, but then, so you know what to make better, you need to understand your value, which brings us to, having that self-introspection on your, uh, what do you want, what you're good at, what do you enjoy doing? Because your value is going to come from those things, your self-awareness and your self-knowledge. That's where everything starts. So first you look into you, into yourself, to, to then be able to execute those other steps and then say, okay, this is the value I bring to the table, where I can deliver that value to be successful and then be able to transition. In my case, for example, I had checklists, I had a plan, I had literally a month by month plan on where I wanted to be because that's how I am. You don't need to be that level of detail, but 
you need to go through your process and mm -hmm. again, start looking inwards, define what's the process that works for you so you can find the value and then you can find who is going to buy that value. And that's how you make a successful transition. I believe that's how I made my successful transitions. That's a those, that's a great tip, because, you know, and uh, and I think it helps lay it out for everyone in a way they can understand and and take that personal journey. So, John, I'd like to thank you for sharing your personal journey with us uh, here today, and for providing those top tips and tricks that you have used um, and been successful with your career transition. So I think that's been, uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed our conversation here today and, uh, and is looking forward to the next sessions. But thanks again, John. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, for our participants, we're about to sign off here. Just make sure you're back um, in the auditorium by 1 p.m. for the next informative session. Um, and that will be a talk between two senior executives about how energy companies are transforming and what skills are in demand. And in the meantime, Time. You have half an hour starting now to go back into, um, into the information hall, the resource booths. Check out those booths, talk to the attendees there. They're there for half an hour for a live chat right now, and, uh, and they'll be happy to speak with you. Um, make sure you participate, collect those participant points that you're getting today to win some great prizes. And thanks for joining us. Have a great break, everyone. And thanks again, John and uh, wish everyone all the best. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tamara. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.